Welcome. Good morning. Welcome to Belgrade Online, an online ministry of Belgrade Avenue United Methodist Church. Welcome to Belgrade Online. I'm Dan, the video editor of Belgrade Online. It's a new year, and once again, Belgrade Online will be making some changes. Our world is ever-changing, and we want to keep things fresh here at Belgrade Online. So be watching for some changes in the coming weeks. And now, without further ado, here are this week's announcements, followed by Dan's sermon and some music to brighten your day. Thanks again for watching Belgrade Online. This week is Second Harvest. That means we are looking for your help to bless our community by distributing produce to people in need. If you are available on Monday from about 10.30 a.m. to 1.15 p.m., please come to the Belgrade parking lot here at 325 Sherman in North Mankato around 10.30 on Monday. We hope to see you there. Dress for the weather. This Wednesday night at 6 p.m., Kent Calm is a Bible study called In the Footsteps of Jesus. And it's a great Bible study and discussion group. And there's going to be some video teaching portions each week by Max Licato. And the teachings were filmed um, in the Holy Land. And each week we're going to be talking about um, one specific uh, text from Scripture. And the videos each week will, uh, the teachings that Max Licato does, were shot where the teachings took place. Um, in the Holy Land. So we'll get to see a teaching on them by Max Lucado um, via video uh, in the place that they were thought to be originally taught. So it's going to be kind of a, a super cool thing. And um, I want to invite you all to that this coming Wednesday night, starting at 6 p.m. And there'll be a dinner so you can come hungry. And then uh, the discussion group will start around 6.30 and um, last uh, should, should be under an hour. So um, invite you to that. It's going to be wonderful. And um, that will be in uh, conjunction with the Sunday sermon series that kind of go together um, called The Other Side of the Shadows. So um, I invite you to that this, this Wednesday night and every Wednesday night through the duration of Lent leading up to Easter. So, um, hope to see you there, and um, hope you have a fantastic week. Hey, what's going on, y'all? Uh, Pastor Dan here with a, a quick announcement here. We've got um, our all-church Wow Zone event is on the calendar. It's going to be for the final Wednesday in March. I believe that's March uh, Wednesday, March 29th. It's going to be from 5 to 8 at Wow Zone, and it's completely on the church. So you can come, you can eat some pizza, uh, we'll get some dessert, we got some sodas and other drinks there for you. We got the whole VIP lounge reserved for us. Um, so we can, uh, you can do unlimited bowling and laser tag and mini golf and each person will get a $10 arcade gift card to start with. And, um, just even if you don't want to do any of those things, just come out and hang out. It'll be a wonderful time to be together. And, and who doesn't, who, who needs a reason to get together, right? Let's just get together. Um, so that's Wednesday, March 29th. Um, we're going to be suspending the, uh, Bible study that night, um, canceling it for that evening so that we can all go out and have an all church, big small group together. And then we'll resume the small group the following Wednesday night. So, um, Wednesday the 29th, wow zone five to eight. It's on us. Hope to see you there. Hey, morning, y'all. Pastor Dan here. Hope everyone's having a great weekend so far. Um, snowing a little bit this morning, but it looks like it is done now, hopefully. And uh, hopefully we can get out of this snow and no more storms. Speaking of storms, that's what we're talking about this morning. We're in a week two of our series called The Other Side of the Shadows, Journeying Through Our Internal Roadblocks. And we're talking about the idea that, you know, um, the only way out of life's storms is to go through them. Not around, not above, not avoid, not turn around and run the other way. The only way out is through. Um, because on the other side is where change happens. Storms, going through them, uh, going through life's roadblocks, 
getting to the other side is where change happens. And last week we talked about the, the, the shadow of doubt on how doubt is not the opposite of faith. Certainty is actually the opposite of faith. And um, you might say, well, there's lots of scriptures that talk about how, you know, Jesus chastised the disciples for doubt instead of faith and da da da. I said, well, that's fantastic. Um, however, that's a good that's a good note. However, um, that's not necessarily what we talk about when we talk about faith and doubt. But that's what we talked about last week. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. My goodness. All right. Well, we're in a series called "The Other Side of the Shadows," uh, <clears throat> journeying through internal roadblocks and. Last week, we kind of introduced the series, and we, um, we talked about the fact that when it comes to our internal struggles, the things, the things we deal with on the inside, um, may it be doubt or discouragement or distractions, maybe it's temptations um, or worry, shame, despair, trauma, whatever else, whatever else it could be that we're dealing with on the inside, we talked about the fact that the only way out is through it. The only way out of those kind of shadows is to go through them. Not go around them, not go above them, but to go through them. And many times we find ourselves in seasons where we experience these things, you know, it's like, it's kind of like standing in front of a dark tunnel at night. And you got to get home, and the only way home is through that tunnel. But the shadows in the tunnel are so incredibly intimidating that we try to find another way. But there isn't one. We can't turn around in the wrong direction because we'll drift away from home. Um, we could do that, but we're gonna, we'll, we'll be drifting farther just to avoid the shadows. Or we could face the darkness, move forward, and head home. So the only way out through our internal struggles is through them. The only way out is through. Um, we may want God to remove the obstacle, but God has never promised that that would be the case. Instead, he promises to be with us in the midst of it. You know, like we said in Psalm 23, verse 4, the popular verse, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, Lord. It's the fact that God is with us through it all. That's what he promises. Not to take the shadows away, but to be with us as we move through them. And the only way out is through. So if we can move forward and, and, and submit to the process in humility, um, we'll find that the journey will have changed us in the process. On the other side of the shadows, we'll find transformation. So um, that's what this series is about. And last week we talked about one of those shadows that we all face. We talked about the shadow of doubt. Um, and we looked at a couple different kinds of doubt you know, how we can doubt ourselves or God or our situations or uh, our, even our faith, our beliefs, our relationships, um, those kinds of things, friendships. We talked about the tendency that we all have to be afraid to doubt anything and uh, because we feel like the opposite of, of faith is doubt. So if faith is good, doubt is bad, right? But that's not true. The opposite of faith isn't doubt. The opposite of faith is actually um, dogged certainty. Because certainty requires no trust. To have doubt and choose to move forward and trust in God, that's actually some mountain-moving faith. And so um, <clears throat> we talked about that last week. If you, if you weren't able to, to catch that, I, I encourage you to go, go, go online and check that out. Um, but we have to go forwards through the tunnel <clears throat> and face the shadows. And so this morning we're going to talk about we're going to talk about um, another one of these shadows that we face. Um, and this is, uh, this is um, going to be a bit more of an all-encompassing kind of a thing. <clears throat> and that'll make more sense as we get going. But, um, so let's pray, and then we'll get into it. I'm going to pray for, for the message real fast here. So, <clears throat> if I don't hack up a lung. <laughs> Excuse me. <sighs> oh. God, we thank you so much for this morning. Um, it's freezing cold outside, but it's warm in here. Um, and I thank you for this time when we can be together. Pray that you would speak through me, that my words wouldn't be my own, but that they'd be from you, and that we'd all have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts that understand what your Spirit is saying to all of us this morning. 
so to mold us and shape us and transform us so that we can be a light in this world. In your name, amen, amen. Well, you know, we, uh, I saw this, uh, this, this, I don't remember where I saw it, but I saw this, uh, <laughs> this meme somewhere in my photos in my phone that I'd saved, and it reminded me of this morning, and I'll have Dan throw it up here. <laughs> this is, uh, it says, I live in Minnesota, I love Minnesota, but it's 53 degrees warmer in my fridge right now than it is outside. <laughs> now, it's, it's not that cold right now. It's 25 degrees. That's like a heat wave, you know, for our winters, right? But that attitude is the same. I'm done with winter. <laughs> I'd like to move on. Please, Mother Nature, give us a break, right? Um, that kind of leads me into a story. So uh, a couple years ago, we went on vacation. We usually, we didn't this year, but usually we go, we'll go to Florida uh, in the winter months to break up the winter a little bit. And, and uh, we, we save and we, uh, we, we pack the, the, uh, the expenses down so that it's, a, it's as, as cheap as possible. Um, I don't like spending a lot of money. I'm, I'm cheap, so that's a, I think sometimes that's a good thing. Um, but... So we always drive to Florida, and we'll drive all night um, to minimize hotel expenses and all that kind of stuff and, and just make the trip quicker. Um, so we were planning on going to Florida, and it was two years ago, like we, but this particular year was, was exciting because we'd all been planning this for a year. Uh, Beth's brother and his family, um, which he's got, uh, I think, five or six kids total, biological and adopted total, and then our three kids, we all planned on, on going and renting this house together um, a couple blocks from the beach in Florida. And um, our kids would get to play with their cousins. And this house had a, had a pool and a hot tub in the, in the backyard and um, it had bunk bedrooms. And, and uh, we were, like I said, we were, we were two blocks away from the beach in Destin, Florida, which there's emerald green, emerald green water and sugar, white sugar sand uh, beaches. And we couldn't wait. Like I said, we would always drive through the night to, to uh, minimize costs, and we would pull over and use a rest stop, you know, take, if we needed a nap or something. And um, We were on a mission, and we were on a mission for paradise, baby. We were going for it. And um, the day came, we packed up and headed down to Florida, and all was right with the world until about 10 p.m., because that's when the snowstorm hit. <laughs> um, now, we're Minnesotans. Born and raised, Beth and I, so a little snowstorm wasn't going to stress us out, much less slow us down, uh, but this was no ordinary snowstorm. This was a giant national blizzard um, that just happened to show up on the 24-hour window we were driving to Florida, <laughs> and um, the, uh, the likes of which the South was not prepared to handle, and um, so it was like... 10 p.m., um, and we just happened to be crossing over into southern state territory, and um, uh, it was no ordinary snowstorm. Um, we weren't in Minnesota. Um, we were used to driving in the snow uh, because we have snow plows <laughs> in Minnesota. And when we're sharing the road with other drivers who we may think don't know how to drive, uh, but if you've ever shared the roads with southern people, in a national blizzard, you'll long for the bad Minnesota drivers. Uh, so we're in this giant blizzard, which we hit as soon as it got dark, there were no snow plows, and we'd be driving down the freeway with snow blustering over the road. Um, the road conditions seemed fine, so we could get up to speed, and we're in the dark somewhere in Missouri or Arkansas or Tennessee, I don't really know where we were at that point. We were white knuckling it, because we'd be doing fine, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it, it's, like, it's like somebody just drew a line across the road and there would be six inches to a foot of snow just sitting there. And we'd hit it and we'd skid, you know, in a van with, you know, with all of us. And um, you couldn't see and you had no idea when the deep snow would appear or not. Because the road seemed fine, but you had no idea when all of a sudden this like 50 yard patch of snow and it would be periodically every few minutes or so. Um, so, needless to say, uh, it didn't get above zero until we hit Arkansas, and it didn't get, we didn't get out of the snow until Alabama the next morning. And the next morning, my nerves were a bit shot, 
And so if I could illustrate how I felt, I would say this. <laughs> we took that picture <laughs> that morning. <laughs> and so storms, storms. We think about storms. We usually think about hurricanes or heavy rains or something like that. You know, we're good, we're good northerners, so the, the storms we see are usually frozen storms most of the year. And we all, you know, when, it, when it's not a snowstorm, when it's, you know, in the summertime and it's more of a rainstorm, we all love a good storm until we're in one. And uh, especially when we're talking about the storms of life. When the storms we're talking about are the storms of life, it gets a little shady. It gets a little different. You know, we can, we can look at minor storms, like we get in a minor fender bender, or we feel like we're stuck in a rut, or our house is a mess, and we got to clean it, and the dishes are piling up, and we're irritated and stressed. Something comes up that ruins our plans for the weekend, or we were saving money, and, and something comes up, and we now have to use that money for something adult, like fixing our carburetor or water heater or something, you know, whatever, instead of what we really wanted to use the money on, you know. Those are, those are what I call driving to Florida in a blizzard kind of storms. They're annoying, they're nerve-wracking, but you get through it. You'll get through it and it'll be fine. It's just irritating. So there's minor storms, but then there's bigger storms as well. Storms that are more dangerous and can do more damage. Things that I call like Hurricane Katrina kind of storms where there's not just a huge annoyance, but it's a storm that we go through in life that's potentially life-altering. A life-altering kind of storm, like when, when your boss calls you in and says your position's being eliminated or asks for your resignation, or the doctor calls you in to their private office to speak with you, which we all know what that means. Or you realize that maybe your marriage is ending, or you get that call and a loved one has passed away. And for a moment, your world stops spinning. And you're tossed by the waves of a storm. So there's big storms. There's little storms. There's hurricane level kind of storms. What do we make of the storms when they unleash on us? How do we get past the storms of life? What do we do in the midst of them? How do we get past them? How do we get through that shadow to the other side? I, mean, I, think that, I think that scripture has quite a bit to say about this. Jesus was no stranger to storms. The people of God are no stranger to storms. Jesus' followers were no stranger to storms. And neither are his followers today, us, stranger to storms. In Matthew 14, verse 22 to 32, there's a story about Jesus in the storms. And um, we talked about this a little bit this past Wednesday night in, in uh, Kent Calm's uh, Bible study with Max Lucado. And, um, and I'm going to come at it from a bit of a different angle. So the scriptures say this. It says, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. Um, the, the body of water they're talking about is this, like the Sea of Galilee, this giant inland sea, pretty much. Um, and so he says, after he had dismissed him, Jesus went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, Jesus was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land. It was buffeted by the waves. Don't you love biblical language? Buffeted. Buffeted by the waves. Because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake, like you do. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified, and they said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Peter replied, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Why he thought of that, I have no idea. <laughs> um, I would have wanted Jesus to come in the boat with me. I would have never thought to want to go out on the water. Um, and we always get Peter flack for this next part, but he had more courage than I would have had in that moment. 
And so, so Peter gets, gets out of the boat, walks on the water, and comes towards Jesus. But when he sees the wind, and he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cries out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. And he says, you have little faith. Why'd you doubt? And when they climbed to the boat, the wind died down. So there's a story of Jesus. He's going up to pray. He sends the disciples ahead of him. Jesus is tired. He's going to go rest. He's going to kind of refill himself spiritually. And, and uh, he's been ministering constantly. And so he sends the disciples ahead. Um, and this giant storm breaks out. And they all think they're going to die. They all, the boat's being rocked back and forth, forward to back, going everywhere, spinning around, whatever. There's this huge storm, and the disciples are in the midst of it. And in the midst of this, Jesus comes, walks on the water. They think he's a ghost. He says, nope, it's just me. And Peter says, for whatever reason, well, can I come out to you? And Jesus is like, sure. (laughs) Peter gets out and is apparently tromping on the waves on the water. And then he sees the waves and realizes what he'd done and then starts to sink. It's kind of like those old cartoons of like Wile E. Coyote when he's like running off the cliff and he's running in air and he doesn't like fall until he realizes the ground is back there, you know. Um, It's almost like this cartoonish story like that. Um, And then he picks him back up, goes in the boat. He says, why'd you doubt? Now you might be saying, hold on a second. You said last week that doubt is not the opposite of faith. But here it looks like Jesus just said it is. Um, In short, that's not what Jesus is saying. It's a a different thing altogether. I don't have time to go into it, but I just wanted to say that. If you want to talk about that more, you can come talk to me later about it. But um, we'll we'll talk about what that means in a little bit. But it's not not contradicting what I mentioned last week. Um, So here's what's going on. In the ancient Near East... Um, water and storms in the sea, it symbolized great powers of evil, that which destroys and sinks and pulls down, because um, they believed there was like this God that would, that would pull you down under the deep, and, you know, and, and so that was all part of it. And, and, um, but so they're, they're being tossed, and the, the writer of this, the, the, the person who's recounting this story is making it very, uh, making a point with the waves and the way he's wording this in the Greek, that the storms of life are coming, and in the midst of it, if we can keep our eyes on Jesus, it'll get us through it. That's a very simple way of looking at it, and it's true, but there's a bit more depth there. Um, And so let's look at a couple points from the Scripture passage. The first thing is that Early on in the, in the passage, it said that the boat was a long way from land. And it's interesting because doesn't it always seem like when storms hit your life that your boat is far away from land? It's, it's, the, the storms always come at the worst possible times. You know, it's like when you're, when you're in a hurry and there's those like door handle, like lever door handles, and when, it's only in a, in, your, in a hurry when that door handle gets caught on your belt, <laughs> you know? Or some handle something, or your, or the bag of your when you're carrying your your ladies your purse or guys your man purse. I don't know what you call it. I carry one, whatever it is, my laptop and my books in it. <laughs> the handle, even the round handle, the, the the back of the strap always gets caught on the doorknob when I'm in a hurry. Grr, you know. But it's why does it seem like our boat is always far from shore when the storms come? When the storms come. And then the scriptures say that. It was the, the boat was being buffeted by the waves. The word buffeted in, in, here in Greek, it just basically means to be struck blow after blow after blow. Like the word buffeted, think of like stepping in the ring with Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson is the buffeter. <laughs> you know, being buffeted is to be struck blow after blow after blow is what that means. Um, but then it doesn't stop there. He says, and the wind was against the boat. The writer didn't have to write those things. We all know what a storm is. We all, everybody in the, in the first century would have known what happens to a small boat on the Sea of Galilee when there's a storm. And so the writers used their words very carefully um, because in, in the, uh, the first century, to write was 
and to write uh, anything down was very expensive and time because there wasn't like any paper mills and there was papyrus and it had to be made and then you had to get ink and then you had to find somebody who was literate and somebody who knew how to write and, and how to do it all legibly so other people could, you know. So, to, so the scriptures were written down. They were written down in a specific way, very intentionally. There's no flippant language. Every word meant something. The structure of how they wrote and the stories and the order in which the stories are in the Bible, because they're not chronological, are all for a reason. They're not haphazard or flippant. Everything had meaning. And so the reason, so even in the words that they're using, the writer is using words like buffeted, by the waves, and the wind was against. The word there is like pushing against the boat, like coming after it. And, and that's what storms are. They like buffet us. They come at us. And it makes us feel like we're overturned and, and caught in an undertow and, and just rolling around and the, the storm just kind of keeps kicking us down the road. And when you think about when storms come in life, why are they irritating? Why are they hurtful? Why are they dangerous? Why are they life-threatening? It's because they can, they can hold us back, like the wind being against a boat. They can slow us down when we're, when we're headed somewhere and we're making progress. We're finally making progress in that thing we've been working on for so long. And then, bang, something hits us, knocks us off track, and we find ourselves four steps backwards. Storms hold us back, but they can threaten our way of life. When you take a financial hit, a big one, your whole way of life is threatened. But not only can a storm threaten our whole way of life, storms can literally threaten our own lives. Like when the disciples were in the boat that day, they were in danger of dying, of, of being knocked out of the boat and drowning. And storms, whatever it could be, could maybe, maybe we're facing a storm that's life-threatening to us or life-threatening to a loved one. We all experience these kinds of things. So what do, what do we do in the midst of it? Well, here's what Jesus says. Jesus shows up. And he sees that they're afraid. Because when we get in those situations, we get fearful. We get, we're up in arms naturally, right? I'm not saying anything that isn't obvious. We get, and Jesus says his, his response to this is to take courage. Now here's the thing about courage. Here's what he's saying here. In the midst of your storm, take courage doesn't mean, all right, and move forward like in an epic Spartacus or movie or gladiator or something. Courage is not the absence of fear. You can be the most anxiety-ridden, overtaken by fear, cowering, feeling like you want to go cower in the corner. But if you have just the tiniest bit of inkling in the midst of your shaking to just take a step to move forward, that's this kind of courage that he's speaking of here. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is being overcome by fear, but choosing to go forward regardless. Hesitating, but you're still moving. That's courage. It's not the absence of fear. It's moving forward. The choice to move forward in spite of your fear and in spite of your anxiety. Every ounce in you wants to stop, wants to quit, wants to lay down, wants to go backwards, wants to retreat, whatever. But you keep moving forward. That's courage. Because the only way out is through. But if you're going to go through it, you have to have courage. Not this kind of courage. Maybe it's just this kind of courage. But I would submit that when you're in this kind of a state... And when everyone's in this kind of an attitude, courage isn't, anybody can, you know, courage just comes, right? But when you're shaky and you're fighting to take one next step, that's like the God kind of courage. That's the kind of courage that actually changes things in our lives. 
Because change and transformation doesn't come when we're, when we're on top, when we got it all under control. Change comes when we're at our most vulnerable. Change comes when the, when, the, when the waves are buffeting our boat and the winds are against us, but we choose to keep going on. That's transformational courage. That's when, that's when we change. That's when our character gets strengthened. That's when we're actually growing. Our brain is making new neural pathways. Our body is learning a new way that, hey, I can get through this and I'm not dying. I might be close, but I'm getting through it. I'm moving through. We're creating new habits. We're creating new fortitude. Take courage. Yes, Jesus says, take courage. It is I. If you're having trouble with the courage, remember who's with you. God's with you in the midst of it. And for whatever reason, Peter says, if it's really you, tell me to come out on the water. Again, I have no idea why Peter thought of that or why he would have done such a thing. But he said that, and Jesus said, okay, come on, and Peter gets out of the boat. And so he's looking at Jesus. And when he's looking at Jesus, he's got the courage to move forward. And he says, but then when he turns around and he sees the buffeting waves and he sees the, the opposing winds, he starts to sink. There's no way out of the storm but through it. Now, Peter's getting his eyes on the waves and getting his eyes on the winds and getting his eyes off Jesus. That's, that's the obvious um, point of, uh, one of the obvious main points here. But there's more going on. Because as we're going through these storms, We each have different scenarios. Like I said, we each go through storms that are minor and major. We each go through different things. Our circumstances are different. Our temperaments are different. What triggers us and and sets us into a tailspin is all different. Whatever whatever it is that that we get our eyes on, whatever the winds and the waves are that, that send us into this tailspin, is different. What a lot of people say in this scenario is Peter sank because he got his eyes off Jesus and on to the wind and the waves. But that's not what I think is really happening. Yeah, he sees Jesus and he gets his eyes off Jesus, but there's no way he couldn't have noticed the wind and the waves. The point is, is he let the wind and the waves determine what he did instead of taking the courage that he was told he had. And Peter initially chose to get out and go through the storm. He was like, well, if maybe he was thinking, well, Jesus said I can get out of the boat and walk on the water, then we'll be on the water and we'll just walk on out of here. <laughs> we'll walk to the other side. I don't know. But the point is, is somewhere after he got off, out of the boat and started walking, he realized, I, I don't want to do this. He stopped taking the steps. He stopped going through. But there's no way around the storm. You've got to go through it. So how do we go through the storms? What is it? How, how do we see all of this stuff, yet take the courage that God is telling us that we have when he's with us? Like I said, each scenario is different. I can't answer that question for everyone, but I can encourage you with one bit of advice. And this advice is simple. It's all in our attitude. When it comes to being successful in life, whatever you define success as, it literally everything comes down to your attitude. That's the key to anything, is attitude. It's how we think about something. It's how we approach the situation. And if it catches us by surprise, it's how we respond. And all of these things are determined by our attitudes. It's our attitude. Here's what I mean by this. When we get to storms, we want an instant relief. We want Jesus to say, let me, get, let me walk on the water. Let's run on out of here. But like almost anything in life, instant relief is not what we need. Because what happens when we do that, when we look for instant relief, we're trying to get out of the storm. It's kind of like, it's kinda like we, we, we rock the boat. 
You know, in a storm, maybe, maybe rushing from one side of the boat to the other to see what's going on and, and you're frantically grasping and hoping and attempting to get the storm stilled or, or whatever and the boat rocks and you end up capsizing it. And when you're going back and forth to these different extremes, these different sides of the boat, you got one side of the boat where you're responding to the storm, your attitude might be passivity. When a storm comes, you might, you know, feel passive and fatigued. You don't have the energy to deal with it. You just want it to disappear. Not willing to do anything about it. But you got to keep the boat moving straight through the waves. Because if you don't do anything, eventually the waves will turn the boat sideways and will capsize it. But if you keep the boat going straight through the waves, you'll go through them. So you got, we could be passive. Our attitudes can be passive on one side. But on the other side of the boat, you could take the other extreme where you're actively moving toward the waves, you're weathering the storm, but we get too hasty about it and we, we get ahead of ourselves. We get ahead of the process. Like an example of this, I always use this as, so like when I get stressed, I stress eat. Um, and I can gain an inhumane amount of weight in a very short amount of time. <laughs> um, and when that happens, I get all kinds of symptoms in my body and my mind, and I get unhealthy, and, and that causes all kinds of extra storms, you know. Sometimes we're the cause of our own storms. Sometimes we're not. It just comes on us. Um, and I used to be passive and just sit in the boat and pray that the whole thing just goes away and I'll magically figure out someday how to be healthy again. If I don't think about my calories, they don't count. <laughs> Right? Um, and when I say storms, I'm saying like my body will retaliate against me. And I'm, it's very difficult to function in different ways. Um, but I could be passive. But then, it's kind of like I went to the other extreme. Then I figured out how to do it, how to lose weight easily and quickly. And I cut my calories and I cut my carbohydrates so low, uh, too low for any adult human. And I'd fast and I'd do workouts that are incredibly taxing on my nervous system and I wouldn't allow proper time for recovery, and the weight would come off really, really fast. But the problem is, is when the weight comes off quickly, you gain it back quickly. <laughs> because you're now exhausted from the intense diet at the end of it, and the workout plan you were on, and you can't sustain it, not realistically, and then you just yo-yo it back on again. Fat weight, you know, fast weight loss is not healthy weight loss. You know, it, it can create vitamin deficiencies and sleep issues and lead to a ton of other health issues and whatnot. And, and uh, plus, when you inevitably do gain that weight back, um, you'll gain more than you had to begin with and your body will actually create new fat cells to store it and that is very difficult to get rid of now. And then when that happens, you'll, you'll say, well, it worked for me last time, so you'll try to do it all again, only now it's more difficult to lose, so you double down on your efforts, and then just downward spiral. It just repeats itself and repeats itself. Now you're a yo-yo dieter. And by you, I mean me. And so that creates all kinds of other problems in, in your health in the long run, and the best way to combat this kind of a thing is slow and steady. So that's where I'm at now with my health journey. You aim for the highest impact with the most minimal effort. <laughs> and you make it part of your life and you create new habits a little bit at a time. That's transformation, okay? The other may be harder work, but it's a quick fix. But you want permanent change. And that's what happens when, if we're, when storms in our life hit. We can go to one side and rock the boat and be passive in our attitudes. On the other side, we can get so extreme that we get ahead of ourselves that we end up causing our own storms in the midst of it all. But we want permanent transformation. We want to get out of the storm changed, positively changed. We want permanent change, not just a quick fix. And this applies to anything in our life. It's true financially. You think of the term money easily gained is money easily lost. You've heard that? It's also true relationally. Rushing in too fast without really knowing someone can cause you to be hurt when you actually do get to know them. <laughs> it's also true in work because if you work too hard, too hastily, for too long, you'll end up in burnout. So you got your passive attitude, but you got this other attitude. 
and in the middle is a slow and steady. Matthew chapter 11, Jesus tells us in another verse how, uh, how to get through these storms. Matthew 11, verse 28 and 30, he says, Come to me, all you are weary and burdened. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. Here's this word again. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You want to get through the storms, we've got to learn how to take on the yoke of God. What's a yoke? In the first century, a yoke was what you put on oxen while they're treading grain or treading something, you know? What, what, what is yoke? What is that? I don't get his reference to that in this verse. Well, simply, when, um, when you had a young ox that was coming in to learn how to tread grain and they put the yoke on the ox, they would yoke that ox to an older ox. Why would they do that? Well, because if you didn't do that, the younger ox, in all of their spitfire energy, would just go crazy and tromp, tromp, tromp and get tired before the end of the day, and then it would just, you know, would burn out too early and wouldn't get as much done. And the older ox knew to pace themselves, little by little, get it done. Not passive, not incredibly aggressive, not passive aggressive, but slow and steady. Slow and steady. And so they yoked the young ox to the big ox to learn to pace themselves. It's all in our attitude. It's all in how we approach the storm. How do we get through this? Do we lay down? Or do we go crazy and, and frantic and extreme? Neither. We respond by slow and steady. We don't fear. We choose courage. Even if fear is overtaking us, we choose courage. And we choose to move forward, steady, slow through the storm a little bit at a time. The shadows, the winds, the waves, they're staring you straight in the face, but little step, a little step, a little step. But it's all in how we think. It's all in our attitudes. It's all in our mind. Isaiah tw uh, chapter 26, verse 3. The prophet says this. It says, God, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they, everybody say it, trust in you. The highest form of faith and trust is a trust that's done with a head and a heart full of doubt. <laughs> doubt isn't the opposite of trust. Trust is an action. Faith is an action. You walk forward. You keep going, slow and steady, because your mind is, stay, is set. I'm going to keep going forward. Your attitude is I can get this. See, here's the deal. When it says that Peter doubted, we all think he doubted Jesus. And maybe there's some of that. But I think Peter also doubted himself. In our day and age, we think, you know, we, it's almost like we have no problem thinking that God can do something for us. But the real question is, can God do that for me? We have this tendency to think that, you know, yes, God can do all things and all things are possible, but with me? Surely I can't do that. I'm held back by this and this and this. I can't, I can't, I can't. I'm, I'm almost positive that Peter gets out on the waves and he sees it all. He knows Jesus can take care of him. There's no possible way he got out of the boat and he was walking and all of a sudden now he's going to sink. You tell me to get out on the boat and I start walking on the waves, I don't care how many 50-foot waves are there. I'm like, I'm walking on the water. Anything's possible, you know. Peter doubted himself. Listen, Jesus believes in you. God believes in you. You can get through whatever it is that is holding you back. Whatever comes and overtakes you, whatever wind is buffeting you, whatever waves is coming at you, you can get through it. You can get through it. There's a, there's a whole self-element to faith that we forget sometimes. Even with love, Jesus says you've got to love others as you love yourself. If you don't love yourself well, you're not going to love others very well. In the same way, tr there's, there's, it's not just believing God can, can do something for you or with you. It's also believing that you are good enough to, to, to do it as well. With help, you can do it. 
with trust, with, the, with an attitude and a mind that's, that's focused, you can, do, you, can, you can get out on the waves. You can get through your storm, even if you, with wobbly knees and shaken hands and a lot of doubt. But just one tiny step of trust forward through the shadows will get you through. You can do it. You're worthy. You're capable. You can have faith in God, but you also need to have faith in yourself. Jesus says you are enough. You can get through it. It's all about our mindset. And so I'm going to close with this. I'm going to ask Shailen to come up and just kind of play underneath this. But our, our attitudes and our mindsets can get us through incredibly hard times. Um, and there's a story about a man uh, who lived in North Chicago with his four daughters and his one son um, in, the, uh, in the 1800s. And he, and he had built this major amount of wealth as a lawyer and a real estate investor. <clears throat> Despite all of his money and his success, he still uh, chose to be, to be a faithful elder in his local Presbyterian church. Um, all was well with this guy. But in 1870, his son came down with scarlet fever and died. And his life went into a tailspin. But he got up and he kept moving forward. Not ignoring his grief, but in the midst of it. Well, the next year, the great Chicago fire broke out and wiped out all of his real estate assets. A few years after that, the economy took a nosedive and even more of his financial assets were affected. So he thought, with whatever he had left, he wanted to do something to boost his family's spirits. So he sent his wife and his four daughters overseas um, to meet a friend of theirs. And... Um, on the other side of the Atlantic and at the last minute uh, some business issues came up and he wasn't able to go and so he sent his family ahead and said I'll meet you later halfway across the Atlantic Ocean the boat carrying his wife and his four daughters was struck by another vessel and it sank to the bottom of the Atlantic he had no idea a few days later, before he was about to set sail on the ocean to meet his family, he received a telegram message from his wife, and it had only two words on it, and it said, saved alone. His four daughters had died in the tragedy, and his wife was the only survivor. So he's overcome with grief and pain and concern for his wife, who's all alone, and he boards this ship and he sails across the ocean to be with her and to grieve together with her. And he spent days looking over the edge of the boat, this big ship on the waters that claimed the lives of his children and that held them. And when the boat came to the place where the tragedy occurred, the captain came up to him and let him know about it. And he stared over the edge, looking deep down into the waters, knowing that his children were leagues below. And overcome with pain and grief, he started to write. And he writes these words, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. The pain and anguish came out in a song. And the storms of life smashing into his life. And sometimes when the storms smash into our life and the pain gets too much to handle, and sometimes it is too much for us to handle. In those times when we're wrestling with questions of why and how could this have happened, and if blank wouldn't have happened, then, then, then blank, maybe this wouldn't have happened. And when those questions come, which is normal and fine, you don't have to stop there. You ask the questions, you shake your fist at the heavens, and you keep, but you can keep walking through the pain. 
through the storm and through the trench. And when we're exhausted and we've exhausted our tears and our bodies can't handle another wave buffeting us, somehow we can find ways to express our grief in the midst of the storm. This guy's name was Horatio Spafford and he came to a place where he accepted the horrific reality of his situation. He knew he would pass over the spot where his kids went. He knew the grief he'd feel. And he didn't hide in the sleeping quarters of the ship. He didn't attempt to sleep past, sleep past the place. He didn't try to occupy his mind so he wouldn't feel the pain. He walked up to the bow of the boat and he sat there and he looked at the water and he faced the shadow and he watched the waves. And in a way, he felt the storm himself. And his mind stopped asking the questions, which sometimes the questions distract us from just accepting reality. He didn't try to change the past with what ifs or the blame game. He just sat there in his pain and his sorrow and he made peace with the storm and the peace stayed. Did he ever... Did he ever get over that horrific tragedy? Confidently, I can say no. Nobody ever would. Nobody ever does. But as humans made in the image of divine love, we're not meant to get over that kind of a thing. We're not meant to get over tragedies. We're meant to get through them and then be changed on the other side of the shadows. God doesn't cause the storms. Why doesn't he stop them? I don't know. Maybe sometimes he can't. Who knows? But nevertheless, in the midst, God is with us through our storms, through our relational difficulties, through our financial hardships, through our life's issues, through our medical concerns. When the furnace breaks and you spent your last dollar on gas, when the company downsizes and they decide you're one of the trimmings, when people intentionally misunderstand you just so they can point their fingers and numb their own pain, when the doctor says it's terminal, when the when the doctor says maybe it's temporary, but it's going to be a long road. When we doubt the entire process, when there's nothing more you can do, God is there walking with us. Like, is that supposed to make me feel better? Not necessarily. Maybe, maybe not. It's not supposed to do anything other than help us to be aware of it. Because those who suffer with you become bonded to you. And you suffer knowing that God is with you. It creates a bond. And the way out is through the shadows. And it's much better to go through that when you're with someone. Knowing that God is with you. You're more likely to emerge when you're not alone. Let's sing. And let's, let's stand and let's sing that song together. When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul, with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I'll bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my 
thank you for being with us in the midst of any storm, of any trial that we go through. The scriptures say many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. It might not feel like it. Circumstances might not turn out the way we want. But God, help us to hold our attitudes, the attitudes of our minds. Help us to hold them in your care us to know that you're with us. Help, help the seas of our mind and our souls to be calmed and give us peace in the midst of the storm. As we know that on the other side we'll be changed. We love you and we thank you for all that you are. In your name. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Belgrade Online. If it was life-giving and encouraging to you, please let us know by visiting our giving page at baumc.org give. Thanks again for watching and have a blessed week.